الرحيم الحمد والشكر لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله أطهار إخوة وأخوات في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and firstly I would like to firstly I would like to thank the organizers for organizing such an event I think um, it's very important in a madrasa teachers CPD their continuous professional development that there are such programs as this so congratulations to Majlishu Ulama Europa for their continued commitment to uh, teacher development. So what am I going to be speaking about? Um, I'm going to be speaking about, as it says on the screen, age-related learning targets. Now, given the depth of the, of the topic and given the time at my disposal, it's virtually impossible to cover all aspects of age-related targets in general and to be more specific look at individual uh, age groups as it relates to age-related targets so for example uh, key stage three key stage four etc i can't do that because we don't have the time but what i will do is i will give an overview of certain issues that I feel are relevant to age-related learning targets, as well as linking age-related learning targets to wider considerations as they relate to teacher training and individual madrasa teachers' development. If you recall, in a previous session, which I was asked to deliver, I mentioned uh, within that uh, session that there are a certain um, list of standards which teachers are expected to adhere to. And primarily within the state uh, sector in the England, and I'm sure that we have attendees from different countries so maybe in your country also you have a range of standards which have been set by the official governmental education department and these standards are those which define they are those which uh, outline a an individual teacher's commitment to teaching and learning and maintaining or reaching and maintaining these standards are of importance not only to the teacher not only to the environment where they deliver their teaching but they are important to society as a whole in england there are what we call teacher standards and they are many and they are those things, those um, identified benchmarks, which a teacher needs to work towards, a teacher needs to maintain so that they can be said to be delivering a body of knowledge, which is both inclusive, which is um, in tune with the learning needs of individual teach of individual students themselves these teacher standards relate directly to age related learning targets based upon teacher standards an individual teacher should be able to is expected to be able to identify age-related learning targets for the learners, for the pupils, for the students they are charged with, educating. It is something which is meant to be within the individual teacher's toolkit. Now, 
I'm sure that there are some individuals who are teaching in state-run sectors, maybe in private schools, as well as madrasas. So how, does the, how do these teacher standards relate to madrasa education, teaching in the madrasa? Are they also applicable to the madrasa scenario, to the madrasa setting? Well, yes. They may not be the same which have been outlined within the state sector or the sector outside of the madrasa, but nevertheless, we are able to identify a wide range of standards which need to be applied to teaching and learning within the madrasa itself. So the madrasa is a, is a site which is able to absorb teacher standards. And I think maybe, and I'm sure this is the case, um, you yourselves may have thought about uh, these standards. You may have thought about them in a conscious way, or they may have come to you in an unconscious manner. But nevertheless, they need to be present. And so age-related learning targets are a signal that the teacher is in tune with teacher standards and in turn the needs of the cohort which they are teaching. Can you turn to the next slide please, Oliver? Thank you. Um, what came to my mind when trying to position or locate uh, my delivery within the Quranic universe. And remember, our teaching in the madrasa is predicated, is built upon a particular worldview. And that worldview stems from the Quran that Allah Azzawajal has revealed to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and is exemplified by, by the Ahlul Bayt in the Bulwa. So trying to locate this understanding of um, age-related learning targets, teacher standards, how they meld and mesh together, looking at how these are parts of a individual's uh, teacher's CPD, continued continued professional development or continuous professional development, I thought of this ayah. I thought that this ayah captures all what is trying to be said. And that is, the ayah reads, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna allaha la yaghayru ma bi kawmin hatta yaghayru ma bi anfusihim. That Surely Allah Azawajal does not change the what is with or the condition of Mabi Qawmin, what is with a group of people, what is with a nation, Hatta until they engage in the changing Mabi and Fusihim, what is with themselves. And so this idea of continuous uh, or continued professional development highlighting this continued change, this continued uh, absorption and implementation of, of knowledge, which can heighten an individual's teaching, the contact time they have with the body of learners, which they are charged with, educating. Next slide, please, Arthur. So to define the field, to narrow it down and get an understanding of what we're talking about when we, when we talk about age-related um, learning targets. And it would, be, it would be nice to believe that all madrasas want to do the best they can for all their pupils, to give them an Islamic learning experience, which equips them with the basic educational and spiritual skills. Now here, what I think the literature um, 
as it relates to age-related learning targets emphasizes on is the academic uh, side of learning targets. But within the madrasa, what we can understand is that education and spirituality, they, they go hand in hand. They are one and the same thing. So that education devoid of spirituality, what do I mean by spirituality? I mean that constant urge to seek qurba, to seek nearness with Allah Azza wa in all that we do within the madrasa, that's spirituality. We may fail sometimes, but nevertheless, the, the niyyah, the intention is there. So learning targets in the schema which I'm presenting are not solely based upon an individual student's ability to memorize or perform a particular task, but an individual's willingness and the ability to engage with the innate spiritual aspect that is rooted within Islam's uh, worldview, its paradigm, its understanding of what education actually is. Islam's understanding of education is that which brings the abd, the servant, closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, not that which distances them. And so when we talk of learning targets, I hope we can speak of learning targets not only related to academic, uh, intellectual um, uh, milestones, but also spiritual and also emotional milestones as well. So which assist them in gaining the most from the learning opportunities the madrasa provides them with. Ultimately, this approach is a major contribution to the pupil and their family in securing success in fulfilling their personal goals. Now, what you'll find is that throughout the slides um, that I've uh, put together for this presentation, I am not separating the student from their family. And what I'm arguing is this, that any learning targets or sometimes referred to as learning goals which we set should be negotiated between ourselves and our pupils ourselves the pupils and their family so that in reality what we are bringing about is community education i've always argued for that the child in front of us is not representative of themselves only, but they're also representative of their family and of their future children, i.e. the generations which come from them. So when we look at the madrasa and the worth of the madrasa, the role of the madrasa within our communities, then the role of the madrasa is to build, to help to a craft and construct personalities and we can only do this in conjunction with the people themselves as well as their family so in setting any learning target learning targets need to be negotiated with the pupil as well as with their family now there's a very important point that needs to be mentioned how do we know what learning targets should be set. Um, many things are expected of us as madrasa teachers, I know. Um, many of us, we, we engage in teaching with the minimum of resources and we're expected to do wonderful things and alhamdulillah, many consistently do that. But with regards to setting learning targets, there needs to be something prior to the setting of learning targets, to the negotiating of learning targets with the people and their family. And I'm sure you, you know this yourselves. And this is where assessment comes in to play. Uh, assessment prior to any learning taking place. Many teachers complain that we don't have time 
uh, enough time with our students to actually go in depth with them to understand you know their family backgrounds their personal biographies their learning needs etc that there are many demands placed upon the madrasa teacher when it comes to delivering a body of knowledge but that body of knowledge as it relates to learning targets cannot be delivered effectively unless assessment takes place prior to learning. So we need to know from where we, where we are beginning. And we can only do that if we assess. And so initial assessment needs to take place. And that's another uh, um, tool in the madrasa teachers toolkit to initially assess. And by initially assessing, then we can engage in negotiating learning targets, both with the people themselves and their family. Um, next slide, please, Oliver. So I've divided this idea of um, learning targets or learning goals, as I said, sometimes they refer to, into two divisions. One is the institutional context and one is the teacher led context. Now the institutional context relates to the madrasa. May Allah Azza wa protect the madrasa. How the madrasa sees itself, the role the madrasa plays within our communities, what the madrasa has set itself um, uh, in relation to short term and long term aims and objectives. Does the madrasa see itself as only operating within a, uh, a limited environment and outside of that environment, it has no um, role to play? Or does the madrasa see itself as a building block upon which um, communities are, are constructed? If so, then hopefully within the madrasa, and again, I'm talking about the ideal, the reality on the ground is that many madrasas are, are staffed by maybe two or three individuals and they are not aware of these things. We shouldn't kill ourselves. We can only do what's within our capabilities. But once we've been introduced to new bodies of knowledge, then we should seek further understanding and try and implement them where and when possible. So at the institutional level, i.e. the madrasa's level, um, madrasa administration level, learning targets show what madrasas are committed to achieving and providing a clear focus for improvements related to uh, teaching and learning. Learning targets are seen to be most effective when they are used alongside a teacher's own, here's that word now, assessment and monitoring of pupils' progress to inform what needs to happen in the classroom. Now, teachers know best, we say. Teachers know their students best. And so we're constantly relying on teachers to, um, to feed back to the institution, to the madrasa, as it relates to what is taking place in the classroom, in regards to learning. That's what we're focused on, learning, nothing else. Learning academic and learning spiritual and emotional. So via the teacher's observations and via the teacher's engagement with the pupils, via the teacher's setting of work and uh, appraising that work, um, based upon the individual madrasa's instructions, then the teacher is able to provide the right sort of uh, targets via negotiation uh, with the student themselves. So here are a few points with regards to target setting. So what, what do they do? They identify pupils who may have fallen behind and who need extra help to catch up. Does this resonate with anybody? Uh, next slide, please.
again, the inst institutional context. Uh, check that pupils are progressing at the rate needed to meet age-related expectations. Ensure that all pupils make the progress they are capable of, including those pupils who may not be able to achieve predefined expectations. And lastly, I believe, identify areas of teaching that need improving. This comes from the madrasa itself. This comes from the madrasa leadership itself. This is found within the documentation of the madrasa, that the madrasa has this built into their policies with regards to um, student progress uh, and, and teaching. Without the madrasa being committed to this at an institutional level, then it's left to the individual teacher to make it up as they go along. And that's never a good thing. Uh, to take place within a madrasa. Next slide, please. And I'm conscious of the time and I want to leave time for questions and answers if possible. Madrasas must be clear from the outset about their expectations for individual pupils dur during and at the end of the relevant term and academic year. During, so we have a formative assessment and at the end of the academic term or academic year, summative assessment. For learning tar targets to succeed in maximizing pupils' outcomes, what do they need? They need to be set for children from the point when the pupil starts their study with the madrasa. This idea of assessing the needs of the learner prior to any teaching taking place. Some of you may say, well, how can I do that? I haven't got the time. This is where it now, where the madrasa begins to see itself as part and parcel of the community. That time needs to be made for such an appraisal, either a month prior to the madrasa opening or the new term starting, uh, two months prior, uh, but whenever. But this now empowers the, the madrasa and it empowers the teacher. It gives them a bird's eye view of what's taking place. Next slide, please. Learning targets, uh, well here now, the teacher's targets. Learning targets can and do look very different from pupil to pupil. And all of us, I think, would agree that, wouldn't we? Um, we have some very um, high achieving pupils. We have some pupils who are just keeping above the, the average. And we have some pupils who are below the average. Um, we would never set the same learning targets for all pupils. And here now this idea of ILPs, individual learning plans come into effect, whereby we tailor via consultation with the pupil and their parents, the learning targets to be achieved, either on a daily basis, on a weekly, monthly or term basis. Also, uh, learning targets can be from hour to hour. We may have students with um, certain special educational needs. And so we may say, well, uh, every 15 minutes, we've got learning targets that they can achieve um, every half an hour, et cetera. You know the context within which you operate and therefore you need to have um, what is called um, a reflexive um, approach. Any academic or behavioral outcome from Developing skills, maybe in Arabic letter recognition and pronunciation to correct performance of the muqaddima, muqaddima of uh, the, the prayers, that which comes before the prayers. So the muqaddima for the salawat al-khamsa are what? So it's near um, performance of wudu, etc. Might be some um, dhikr, some avqar, etc. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Again, teacher's targets. As well as behavior akhlaq in the madrasa, each can be a target that has been individually negotiated between you as the teacher, the pupil, and their parents. Next slide, please. Excuse me. The process by which goals are set, monitored, and reviewed is key to ensuring uh, goal setting is successful. So, 
start early, number one. Target setting in best practice starts as early as possible. However, some pupils may not be ready at first to think about individual academic targets. This is the reality. Uh, for some students, it is applicable. For others, it's not. You know within your own teaching arena uh, the needs of your students. And you may say, look, for Muhammad, that's possible. But for Zaid, it's not possible. Zaid is not at that level. Zaid needs to mature a bit more. Uh, there are other issues taking place with regards to Zaid. And so what we're focusing on are not learning targets specifically. So the, the acquisition of academic skills, we may be focusing on uh, other targets. For example, um, Zaid coming to the madrasa on time. Zaid having his pens and paper and all the equipment that he needs uh, to study effectively with him. Um, Zaid um, adopting the correct decorum as he engages not only with teachers but also uh, with his other uh, cohort members. So many different ways in which these targets can be set. Uh, therefore, teachers begin with class-wide targets for either behaviour and developing academic skills. So this highlights two ways in which um, targets can be set. We can set targets for the whole class, and in, in that way we can develop a collegiate atmosphere, a cohort atmosphere amongst them, or we can develop individual learning targets. And these two can go side by side at a simultaneously so that they are um, class targets and the rewards that are given for them, as well as there are individual learning targets. And again, the rewards that are given for them. Rewards can be asset, well, well done class, super, fantastic, good behavior, etc. They don't have to be those physical rewards that we sometimes give. Uh, next slide, please, Ara. Um, I apologize if I'm going too fast. Teachers then can move on to setting specific individual targets, such as learning a set of letters or learning and explaining specific amal, amal behavior. So, for example, how you perform wobble, how you perform uh, salat al or salat al asr, etc. And uh, it's not merely a tick box exercise. It's an exercise where the student, the learner, the pupil is um, being acculturated, that, that they're gaining an understanding of the Islamic worldview. So we're not doing it merely as a tick box exercise. If it's coming over like that, I, that's not how it's intended. And that's not how it should be. It should always be about reaffirming the identity of the individual and seeking to provide that which empowers them within their world, within the worldview of Islam. Through the process of setting targets for a class and for themselves, pupils learn to understand what a target is and how it contributes to learning. And this is a very important point. I'm going to finish uh, maybe with the next slide because I do want to take questions if there are any. When we talk about learning targets or learning goals, amongst ourselves, it may take us maybe five minutes to, or even less to understand exactly what we're talking about. But how about a five-year-old or a six-year-old or seven or even a 10-year-old when we talk about learning goals and learning targets with them? They may not understand, and I'd be surprised if they did understand. So what we need to do is we need to use language which is able to um, give over the intentions that we have and make it practical for them. Um, sometimes when we do set learning goals, um, we can visualize the learning goals by using charts on the wall or having a chart in an individual learner's workbook and uh, making sure that um, there are more ticks than crosses there and we're using, you know, stars and all sorts of other um, things which can, you know, um, 
highlight the achievement that the student has, has reached, has attained. We must always, always work towards putting love in the student's heart for their learning rather than pouring cold water in their hearts. Okay, they haven't reached the learning goal or the learning target. What can we do to assist them to do so? Along the process, what have they achieved? And so we recognize the achievement and we also highlight, well, you haven't been able to do that, but never mind. Let's try again. Let's extend the time. Um, let's lessen the target so that we're being reflexive, reflexive to the needs of our learners. Over, I'm sorry, I'll go to, to the next slide, please. Let's see what that is. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the slides um, available to you so you can look at them yourselves and uh, ask any questions that you have yourselves. Can you just flick through the other slides, please, Argo, until the end? Is that the end? Okay, I guess it is. So um, let me give you some, um, some understanding of where I'm coming from uh, as a teacher and as it relates to um, learning goals or learning targets. And primarily within the educational settings that I work in. So for about 30, about, for about 35 years, I've worked in different educational settings, whether it's the Hausa, whether it's the Madrasa, uh, high school, college or university. And I've been fortunate enough, though, to work in all those settings within an, within an Islamic framework. And within each, there have been this need to set learning targets and learning goals. But what I've realized is this, that my expectations of learners in certain circumstances has dictated the learning goals or the learning targets that I have negotiated with them. What I'm trying to say is this, set learning targets which stretch the capabilities of the individual, but don't break them. So that the individual can look back at a process and say, this is where I began and this is where I'm now. And with the assistance of, of the teacher, and that's what we are. We are those who assist in learning. With the assistance of the teacher, um, I've now gone through a process where I've hit maybe five of the identified six or seven targets. I'm going to stop there and hand over to you for questions and answers. And again, my apologies for rushing. I realize I only had uh, limited time. You can raise your hand using Zoom feature. I'll just unmute and ask your question. There are no questions. Does that mean that the content was not understood? Well, I do have a question. I'm just waiting for uh, others to type or raise hand. So while we are waiting for questions, Father, so sometimes in our classes, we have children of different ages. And this is a very common question and situation uh, raised by teachers, uh, Madrasa admin. Uh, sometimes due to certain limitations or circumstances, children of different ages are admitted to the same class. So is there any advice, particular advice that how we deal with this 
situation, particularly if we have limited resources, if we have more teachers and more time, then maybe we can divide them into groups. Is there any advice maybe we can send back to the, the madrasa or back to the parents? I see that sometimes as a disaster. Um, with students of different ages, let's say sometimes you may have a, a six-year-old and an eight or nine-year-old in the same class. Um, for me, that's a disaster. Um, I'm not saying it's an intentional disaster, but I'm saying it's a disaster which can impact upon the students themselves, the 10-year-old with six-year-old students. Given the reality on the ground that there are not the, the resources available, that um, not only they're not resources with regards to textbooks, you know, ETC, but there are not teachers available then this has to take place. What should be made clear to the students is this, that um, let's say X student who is six and Y student who is 10 are not at the same level. That needs to be made clear because when we put a 10 year old into a class which is inhabited by six year olds, what does it do to that 10 year old? What does it do to their confidence? There have been studies um, which have been conducted whereby the 10 year old begins to regress and rather than their cognitive abilities developing and their emotional intelligence ETC developing, they begin to regress to that of the, the dominant age within the classroom, the six year olds. So I think that is a, is, a, is a disaster and we really need to think about that uh, if it actually takes place and how we can avoid the negative fallout of such a scenario impacting on that 10 year old, 11 year old, or sometimes even 15 year old. Um, Uh, um, there is a question, Differenti differentiation for students of different levels and ages when teaching them, how, how do we find the middle ground? Um, well, when we talk about differentiation, what we're talking about is a very important aspect in our, in our teaching. Um, and we have to factor that into every single learning session that we have. What is differentiation? Differentiation is understanding that we may be delivering a body of knowledge to 10 individuals. However, those individuals are not all at the same level. And if the work which we set for all those 10 individuals is completed, let's say by two individuals, 15 minutes before it's completed by the remainder, then what do those individuals who are more able within that particular topic, in that subject, what do they do for the remainder of the time? And so what we've done is we've provided additional work for them. And so here now by providing the additional work for them, we've differentiated. Also differentiation can take place with regards to language that we use so that we may have a body of uh, learners within our class who's uh, mother tongue is not English, or who do not speak English as uh, natives, as we do. Our mother tongues maybe are not English, but we speak English as natives because we've been here. Those of us who are in England, I realize that some are in um, different parts of the, of the world. Um, so we may differentiate with regard to language we, we use. So we may have native Arabic speakers in, in the classroom and the majority of students might be uh, uh, English speakers. And so, or, although the Arabic speaking students speak English, but when speaking to them in their native tongue, they understand the concepts in a, on a much more richer and refined deeper level. So we may switch and use Arabic, or we may switch and use whatever language um, those individual students uh, speak at home. 
on many occasions, I've done that. So I've had in my classroom, not only in the madrasa, but at university level as well, students who spoke Arabic, who spoke uh, Turkish, who spoke uh, Urdia, who spoke uh, Farsi, um, and who spoke Spanish. And let's say we're, we're looking at um, the family and its role within Islam. So those of you who speak a language other than English, what is the word for family in the language which you speak? Okay. And so now when I want to you know, develop that concept of family, does family in English correlate to the word for family that you have in your own particular language? Here we're doing differentiation. Uh, and we're using differentiation also to highlight different social uh, and cultural differences. How do we strike the balance? We always come prepared and we can never differentiate effectively until there is initial assessment. If there's no initial assessment, there can only be teaching from a deficit. When you initially assess, what you do is you open yourself up to the potential of the student and how you are going to respond to the potential of the student in the madrasa. And then you plan effectively, not only with regards to your schemes of work, which are uh, term related or semester related, but also with regards to your individual um, session plans or your lesson plans, which take place on a daily basis. Um, how do we differentiate, here's that word again, or distinct, make a distinction between a teacher's target and a planned scheme? One looks at observing the students and the other updates the plan for the student, or do they both do that? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Let me just read it once more, please. How do we differentiate or make a distinction between a teacher's target and a plan scheme? Okay, if you're talking about plan scheme, do, do you mean a scheme of work or would you like to take the microphone and explain exactly what you mean? I'm not sure what you mean by a, a plan scheme. Um, the only thing that I can go on is the word plan. And if you mean plan scheme, uh, that could be maybe the scheme of work. The scheme of work can reflect many things. Likewise, the individual lesson plan can reflect many things. Here's the reflexivity. Ah, oh, here's the reflexivity. You as the teacher are able to mold and shape uh, the lesson scheme or the lesson plan to suit your needs, okay? So going back to a previous session we had when we looked at smart objectives, okay? We used that word smart, didn't we? Uh, specific, what's this, what does M stand for, anybody? Can anybody quickly type it? Uh, specific, then we have uh, measurable, yeah, S, uh, M, then we have A, achievable, then we have uh, realistic, yeah, and then we have um, uh, time related, yeah, time related, okay. So um, these targets then that we set are in reality connected to our SMART objectives. Can you see how, how everything interlinks with teaching, going all the way back to the intention that we bring to the madrasa? Then we develop these, this understanding of teacher standards. Then we move into uh, how we assess. Then we move into differentiation. Then we move into reflexivity. Then we move into uh, schemes of work and lesson planning. Everything is interrelated as it relates to our professional practice within the madrasa. So within the individual lesson plan, you can set targets. And here, this is the idea of the reflexive nature of the lesson plan. At the end of the session, students as a whole will be able to do X, Y, or Z. 
and you can be more specific and you can say at the end of this session Khadija will be able to do X and Muhammad will be able to do Y okay and they may be the two high achieving students in your class however um, other students uh, Zaid, uh, Bakr, uh, Fulan, Fulan will be able to do X and Y according to their individual level. Again, this idea of a differentiation, which is built on what? Initial assessment. Um, should we finish there? Uh, how can targets be achieved with children with special needs? Doesn't this affect their progress, especially when they're put in a particular age group? I have no speciality in special educational needs, SEN. And um, I am aware, though, that there are certain madrasas who have now, alhamdulillah, departments um, of individuals who have gone to university, um, learnt special educational, um, learnt about special educational needs, have got their teacher qualifications as well, gone away and done um, child psychology, etc., and returned into the madrasas and started to work with them. However, speaking in general terms, not with regards to special educational needs, because I have no training in that whatsoever. If you have children with special educational needs, what assessments have been made at the beginning? How have you sat down with their, have you sat down with their parents? Have the parents made available to you the reports which have been written uh, on the children, if there exist any, in mainstream school? And so instead of trying to invent something new, follow the scheme which has been developed by the professionals that add into it that spiritual element. That's all I really feel comfortable, comfortable in mentioning about that. We need experts to deal with that topic. Um, so for Madrasa, we should arrive to group our children based on age or not knowledge and seek to differentiate our assessments. What is your specific setting? You can only work with what you have. Please never um, come away from any discussion that we have where you think I say one size fits all. It doesn't. Knowing the nature of the madrasas, knowing the, how the madrasas are in Africa where I've worked, how they are in South America where I've worked, in the Middle East where I've worked, uh, in the Caribbean where I've worked, in Europe where I've worked, they are completely different entities. And in reality, for some, they don't need the same. You have to judge according to what's taking place in your local setting and do your best with that. But I would strongly caution placing students uh, in the same class if there is like three or four years difference between them. One or two years may not be noticeable, but we have to look from a child's perspective. It may be noticeable from a child's perspective. So how do we overcome that? What are the resources you have on the ground to overcome that? So I would not, I would not advise in my own practice where, where everything is equal let's say ability grouping and i would not advise also in certain circumstances age grouping it depends upon the individual circumstance which is playing itself out where you are there's no one side that fits all. Shall we finish here? Because I'm sure that there is somebody else who needs to deliver and that the time is going. Arva Mathan, over to you. Shukran Jazeelan for everybody for attending. Lovely to meet you. If you have any questions um, that you want to ask me related to general teacher training, 
or specifically Islamic uh, education and Islamic teacher training, which is my speciality, or madrasa education, again, which I specialized in, please do contact me. I'll give you my email address. And it's just for that purpose, nothing else, okay? I, I don't need to be included in any um, circulars or anything like that. So if you want to continue this discussion, here is my email address, and I'm willing to um, discuss any issue related to Islamic education with you. How do you 